welcome to another episode of Whatever It's Cool, the show where we talk about anything and everything that is cool in the world today. I am the boy who cried wolf, Daniel Porcro. On this episode, I have a sit-down interview with Haven Everly. We talk about her growing up in a musical family, her latest single, Raised by Wolves, and also her appearance in The Girl Who Left Home. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Growing Pains with Haven Everly. Show. Um, I know you are very busy, and we have tried to be, uh, to schedule this. So I do take it. Uh, well, I do thank you for taking the time out to be here. Um, the first thing I need to do, normally I say it's a pleasure. One thing I want to point out because it was back in 2019, the very first time I ever saw any of your content, and um, I got a bone to pick with you on this one. So the first video I ever saw was, uh, you know, what it's like to be with a Filipino girlfriend. And it pointed out a lot of traits that I do. And one trait that I have never thought I'd done, I used to see my sisters, my mom, all my aunties do it, the pointing. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's really resourceful. Like, what if your hands are full? You know what I mean? I know. Like, but I, I just, I, the, the eye shattered when, um, when, oh, sorry, not the eyes, the, 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 the glass broke when, when I, I saw it. I was like, I don't do that, do I? And all my friends went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are Filipino after all, so you must have done it at least once or twice in your life. Uh, apparently I, I do it all the time, so. Yeah. yeah. See? It's really, it's really hard. Like, mm, mm. You know, it's easier. And the eyebrow thing. Like, mm. Yeah. Mm, mm. See, like, no words necessary. We can really, literally have a conversation without any words, like, and you'll know exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, but I, I, I love that so much. And um, I wasn't with my with my girlfriend at the time. Um, and then, you know, I showed it to her recently. And she goes, yeah, I do all that. And I'm going to be like that um, when, when we get married. I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I've, I've, already, I've already dealt with that before with my, with my parents. So um, it's nothing out of the ordinary for me. <laughs> Especially, uh, sure. especially the uh, the cutting of the paper towels. Like I, I, I thought my mum was the only one who did that. Uh, yeah, thank you. you gotta be resourceful. You oh, gotta yeah. be resourceful. <laughs> Why do you need a huge paper towel? You could just cut it in half and double the amount. Exactly. Right? Oh, definitely. Um, <laughs> now, we're here to talk about your, your latest single. That actually, no, I'm gonna let you let you, let you tell me what happened. Um, because you posted something about this recently, and um. First and foremost, kudos because that's something that I would do, and I'm glad that someone who's in this, uh, in this world that is that does something like something that I would do. Oh my gosh, I don't even know where to begin. I think okay, I think I want to preface that whole fiasco. So just for people who are listening right now, what had happened was I have been anticipating and planning this release date for my first ever single to be released, and upon the release date, the night before. I realized that I had uploaded the wrong mix and the wrong track to uh, to all the platforms. And so I obviously break down in tears because it's a lot of work for preparation and to like promote and things like that and have everybody wait and who are excited, who are supportive and then tell them just kidding, you know. So I it was really difficult. But um, what I did learn is that well, one, I am I'm still learning as I journey through this indie independent world of music. And two, I have so many great supporters who are so loyal and so kind and so patient. Um, so many people are like, it's gonna be okay and it's gonna be fine. And um, I think what I think what people all in the back end of things, what people don't see is how much work it it requires to get to a certain like um, a point of like creating your own art and creating your own music, you become like 20 million people, right? Like you become the the promoter, you become the person who's doing all the logistics, you become the, you know, the the person that's networking, you become the artist, you become. So I think what would, what was happening was like, I was, I was kind of a little bit in over my head and sometimes it's hard for me to ask for help. And so I called my sister, um, you know, and I was crying. I was like, oh my gosh, how could I be, you know, such a dork, you know? And she was like, do you need an assistant? And I'm like, yeah, probably, but uh, but I, I wanna learn each and every step. And with every mistake is an opportunity for growth. So I, I, 
I just found out today, though, from uh, my cousin, she she was like, your song is out. So it is out and available now on Spotify. Awesome. And I, yeah, so the, later on this week, it's going to be available on iTunes and all the streaming platforms. And um, so I'm really, really grateful. It was just for a weekend that I was like having so much anxiety. <laughs> oh, gosh, what a rookie mistake. I am so glad I am no longer in music because uh, although it's, geez, how many? I'm, I'm 36, so almost uh, 20 years. Actually, no, hang on, no, it has been. It's been 20 years since uh, when I was still still doing music. Um, I guarantee that if I was in, the, in like, if we had this technology now the way, back when I was still doing it, um, 100% I'd be doing the exact same thing. It's <laughs> because you get you do get nervous when you do it because, like, it's your first track. You want it to be so successful and everything. And you don't think you just go, yep, yeah, click, 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 bang. Yeah. Happens. And the thing is, too, I, I I had so many mixes before we mastered and mixed the final cut. So it, it was really just me and my friend um, Alexander who created. He was the one that produced it and I wrote it. And so I had one of them say, like, final mix number one, final mix. Number, and the word final. Oh, you know, so, yeah. So like, re uh you know label things and make sure that the you know final 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 or the mix and mastered one is the one that i actually upload so there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to these things and so um and it's tough because it's not like an easy just switcheroo i thought i could just like easily but it has to go through this approval process and so that was the hardest part was just the anticipation of having it being approved from all like through all the platforms and making sure it hits those guidelines Mm. so so it was just kind of like I posted and I was like, I lied. Just kidding. Oh, you, you, the, you know, the funny thing is I, I I did film a reaction video to the, um well, the not not finished mix. And literally as I've hit, f- f- finished hitting record, um, I'm about to talk about it. All of a sudden a notification comes up of you saying this went. All right. I'm still going to, I'm still going to talk about it because uh, I think it's pretty good. Um, But I'm just like, Wow, she she's human after all, and that's great. Um, I'm gonna pick on her when when I, when I have her on the show. That's for sure. <laughs> I was literally crying and being like, "Okay, five years from now, I'm probably gonna laugh at this moment." And after like so many singles and albums that I'm gonna release, this is gonna be the one hilarious moment, like the first one I release on my own. I make a huge flub like that to my audience. So it was really hard, though. I'm not going to lie. On uh, that Friday, I was bawling my eyes out like a baby. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? You know, but um, you get through it. And, yeah, I am human. And <laughs> Now, what, what, this is, this is the, let me retrain your brain on the thinking of this one. What you should think of this is, okay, the song is, the, the, I, I stuff up on this bit here. But now everyone's going to hear this 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 song i think it's fantastic all these record labels are going to see it they're going to hear this story going all right you know what we're not going to let that happen again we're going to sign her right here right now because this is a great track and we want to see more from her that's how you should think of it oh that's so sweet you know it's so funny my sister my other sister was like you know it's kind of like you're giving everybody a sneak peek and a behind the scenes of what it's like so it's okay like let them anticipate the actual final product like it's part of the journey and I actually really, you know, when my sisters and I were a group, we that was always the goal. It was like, let's get signed in, in a major label and so everybody else can do all the hard work and we can focus as artists and we can get that promotion and stuff like that, that we want as as artists. But I, I actually do quite enjoy being independent and getting the full control and autonomy of my own music. Mm. So. So this is, I think, all necessary pain, like growing pains. I'm going to call it growing pains because if I, I want to do this longevity long term as part of the, uh, the many things I want to do, I got to learn at least how to upload the problem, proper. <laughs> I think that's going to be the title of your first album, Growing Pains. That 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 that'll be the great, the uh, great great album title, I reckon. Get me started. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing the checks in the mail. Yeah, on that one. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you, yeah, 10%. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, <laughs> God, on what if it's called? We make a lot of money here. Not. Um, <laughs> well, let's talk about the single because um, I, I I have enjoyed it and um, it has actually been replaying in my head a lot, uh, especially like like if you have seen the um, the reaction video. It's uh, the actual chorus that I love the most because, uh, like I said, there's not many music where, you know, they'll incorporate a an animal or, you know, 
some kind of sound effect that's mentioned in the song and then actually do it. And you, you've made, you've done a really, really good um, chorus there. It's very, very memorable. Uh, how did you come up with that? Oh, thank you. That is, I, I feel so, uh, thank you. That like warms my heart. I, I came up, actually, I wrote this song two years ago hmm. and it's shelved. I, I was trying to find the right producer to collaborate with. But the song was inspired, I watched a show, I forgot what the show is called, but um, it was like a speech that someone was saying, like, you know, I was raised by wolves. It was part of just like a one of the lines that he said, and I was like, oh, that sparked such inspiration for me. And um, I grew up feeling kind of like, um, like the cliche of like the starving artist, right? Like, I always was hungry for being a part of an industry that was really difficult to break through, especially at the time when I was younger, back in my day, mm. it wasn't as for someone like me or my sisters, my parents even, to to break through in this industry. My parents are immigrants. And my mom was a pro professional singer in the Philippines. Wow. So, yeah. So my, my dad's a professional singer as well. And so that's how they actually met. So growing up, my, my dad was a DJ and he really trained, my you know, my parents trained us, my sisters and me, to really sing. My brother was a little shy, so he didn't really sing with us. But uh, my sister became a pop group. And um, so it was every weekend rehearsing. We were like the you know, Jackson 5 version of Filipino version, right? And um, we really took it seriously. And so we wanted this to be a career, a, a career thing. But at the time, there wasn't K-pop, there wasn't anything of that nature that really said marketing wise or logistics wise to lay major labels that three Asian girls that can sing pop R&B can make it. So it was one of those things where we were really going against like not only our um, cultural norm, but um, like economic norm or like a culture, like, a, you know, in the country, it wasn't really uh, favored yet, you know. Mm. I felt this resistance from a lot of angles um, and I, I felt a lot of uh, restriction. So it was kind of like we were, we were hustling at a very young age and we were starving and hungry for the desire to just do what we love. And so that's where Raised by Wolves came in because we not only were hungry and we were really, really passionate about what we were doing, we we faced a lot of backlash and negativity and we, we experienced a lot of difficult things in the music industry where it was racism or rejection or even like really bad business. And so um, again, that contributed to this feeling of like, um, I was hungry and I was I was a wolf. I wasn't really like this innocent, you know, just, oh, I want to sing and then I could be on Disney and I can, you know, do. it was it was there was grit and there was there was hunger and there was competition that we were fighting against. We were going against the grain of society's norm. So um, that's where Raised by Wolves came from. And um, even and I actually took a break from singing and music. Um, so my sisters and I we were in New York. We were shopped by major labels and then we kind of gave gave up on it because of all of the adversity. And so we yeah. moved back to Sacramento, where we're from, California. And then I didn't want to give up. And so I decided to um, pursue acting. And so that's when I started acting. Mm. And um, it was kind of similar but different, right? You can audition and you can find roles here and there. And, and I really love acting. So when I started writing this song, I actually approached it like an actor. You know, I, I had this vision it, that's why it's so dramatic, I think, because I had this vision of like, okay, I love the idea of Raised by Wolves. I love the idea of echoing the, oh, like howling to a moon. Yeah. But like, encompass or build this concept and create it into a song that matters or that means something to me. And so um, I thought like, you know, like in movies where they have that pivotal moment where the beast is like, don't come near me. And they're about to reveal themselves. Like that was where I got the inspiration of the pre-hook. Like, uh, but there's no need for searching. You'll finally see I'm not beauty, babe. I'm the beast. And that was like the transition of been raised by wolves. And that's where the lyrics kind of came in. It's like, mm. like the, the transformation of sorts, you know? And so, um, that's where I got the inspiration of the pre-hook. But even if you hear the song, it's kind of a journey of um, an arc. Like in, in acting, there's always an arc to a scene. So I wanted to incorporate what I've learned in acting and create that an arc to the song. So it's like, it starts with like, hey, hey, you know, in like any movie, it's like, I need to tell you something. And then it's like deep in the darkness under the moon lives a painful truth. And that's the lyrics of the pre-hook. And then it the big reveal. 
And then in the second verse, it's like, no damsel in distress underneath the stress. I'm not the rest. I'm dangerous. So it's almost like my claws are out. I'm like, you know, I'm a, like, I'm like the savage, you know, kind of look and, you know, the hungry and the beastly kind of look. And so um, at the end, it's kind of like a, a, a moment of acceptance. It's like, love me, hate me. You'll never break or chain me. And that's like the empowering moment of like, this is who I am, accept me for who I am or leave or mm. face the consequences to make it more dramatic. Right. Yeah. And so the whole concept of how I came up with the song. In short, for anyone who doesn't know, that's what uh, Daniel Filipino is like. Because it's it's true it's true though because like we, they look they uh, like no i shouldn't say they but um a lot of a lot of filipinos in general we look very nice we look very innocent but mess with us the horns come out um i'm living proof of that i look i look you know short short and sweet a um, little bit of a belly but you know you mess with me uh, you know the horns do come out that's for sure um <laughs> i love that it's so hmm. fun Start making some content out of that hmm. But one one thing one thing that's come back from this story though that um, I know for me uh, when I when I was you know doing music doing acting as well um, I was not written it was never uh, successful but I had contemplated going to the Philippines because I thought you know being a being a Harthi I might be able to find more work there the only problem is getting a visa also um, you know I'll, you know getting because I I wasn't born I wasn't born there you know a lot of the customs are going to be very very different have you uh, thought about going over there and making over there because it may have been a little bit more easier. I was told that growing up the entire, you know, my whole life, but I think it's part of my journey to want to kind of break that concept of like, I have to go back to where I came from in order to do what I love. Right. Mm. Right now in the industry, it's a little bit different now with, with how it is. Um, Like you can do what you love. You can be your own. Uh, you can be autonomous, like I said, and still um, quote unquote, make it. And so that's, that's been my journey of like, okay, how can I build my own audience who actually care about what I have to offer from all parts of the world. Hmm. And I did consider it my, you know, my, my parents had connections that they thought they can like try to get us. They did, they did their best. But I think, I think that was, I think that's me being kind of the wolf in me. Like I, I felt like that feeling of like, go back to where you came from to do what you love was kind of like a little bit, I, I took it to offense a little bit. Like I'm also American. I'm also Filipino. And I want to be able to, to break these barriers here in the United States and kind of take out that concept of like, I can't make it here as full as I, I can. I should just go back to where they'll accept me. And so that's part of the grit of my journey. It's like um, when my sisters and I were shopped by major labels, uh, the part of the racism that we we faced was that was um, let's put you in masks. Let's put you in, you know, let's make you an anime before they can really see who you what are. What the hell were they thinking doing that well, kind of crap? And this was back in the day. There wasn't YouTube much yet. There wasn't like, you know, K-pop. So the biggest boy bands was NSYNC and all these kinds of like, you know, D Destiny's Child. So there wasn't like Asian pop groups, right? And so yeah. mm. and I, we grew up singing more R&B, pop, soul. We harmonized, we wrote our own stuff. And, you know, they were like, mm, let's, let's hide you. You guys sound black, let's hide you. And then when your single hits, we'll, we'll then reveal that you guys aren't black. But we, we have to let them accept your voice before they can accept your image. And so that's like being super young, like in my teens and hearing that kind of reaction and response after kind of singing since I was five with my sisters. It was really hard. It was like, why? Like, I think there is an audience and there there are people who will accept us for who we are. And and so that was that was the hard part was like, OK, how do I make this work? And that's partly why my sisters and I, after two years of being in New York and being shopped by major labels, we, we decided to move home because it was a lot of the backlash of what we looked like versus how we sounded. Mm. And so I think when I moved to L.A., there was still a part of me that wanted to pursue music, but I wanted to focus on ways of getting through, like getting through the industry, which is why I've, I discovered content creation. And then I also wanted to pursue acting Um it was all part of the the whole idea that, you know, there are no bounds. Like I can do what I love to do and make a successful living out of it. And anywhere in my home country, which is Philippines, but also in America. Right. Mm. So that's what I'm trying to continue to prove every day when I when I do my art. Mm. 
I think because as you're talking this, I'm, I'm actually I was actually reflecting myself and you know when I was still doing because I was uh, 14 when I first started doing um you know music and everything, and I'm thinking you know what was I listening to because I I'll, I'll, I'll be fair and honest um when I look back on the stuff it was fun at the time I would not do what I did then what it, now now I know who I am or what I'm actually capable of I would never do that again, um but when you're that young if someone tells you certain ways to, to do and everything and if you, you ha- if you have even the slightest um feeling that it's going to boost you up you do it you know but just hearing that now it just it seems barbaric but i got to remember also it was a different time um where so people like us couldn't be noticed um maybe 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 myself maybe because i'm half it's very hard to tell that i'm that i'm filipino but um yeah if you if it if it was noticeable yeah it's there, there weren't that many artists. I think there was a because I always keep seeing um things on TikTok of you know like Filipino artists in the early two thousands. You know that were that were slightly big, but I don't even remember that. You know, so yeah, and a lot of especially like in acting, like a lot of the actors that were Filipino, they would never announce it. They were ambiguous, right? Like you know, Gabriela Montez, Vanessa Hudgens, in High School Musical played Mexican, right? Mm. It was, one of my closest friends, she was on um. She was on Malcolm in the Middle. Mm. I mean, my mom in the film that I'm in, she uh, she was uh, a guest star. She was the, the wife of, um, she was Pia. Uh, and she, she played Inuit. So it's like, she's Filipino. She never played a Filipino role. And she's been acting since the 90s. She never played a Filipino role until the film that we did in 2018. Wow. It's, it's, it's a, a harsh reality, especially here in the United States and Los Angeles. Like it, it was, I mean, when I remember when Pussycat Dolls came out, it was like a huge deal to see Nicole Scherzinger, like one of the many, you know, we were, we would rewind whenever there's an Asian or Filipino person on TV, like here in the U S we were like, Oh my gosh. Like, do you know the Missy Elliott music video? Like the little girl that was dancing when she was Asian, like it was a huge my family and me to like rewind it and be like, Oh my God, she's, she's Asian. She's dancing. She made it, you know, Mm. like how rare it was to see in pop culture in in the mainstream media someone like us well i'll never forget when um i i, I, I would have been 2006 um i was i was working for a t- and um my boss just turned around and goes oh how's it how's it feel to see your uncle on in the wwe and going uncle what do you mean he goes oh batista he's full of pen i went bullshit Really? And then, uh, you know, and this before Wikipedia and all that stuff, so I had to go up online. And after, I think it was like three hours worth of research, I went, he's half Filipino. He's my uncle, yes! I'm finally someone that I can relate to in mainstream media, finally! Because obviously yeah. I'm a big wrestling fan, so that's the only way I could do it. But the other one would have been like Tia Carrera when I found out that she was um, Filipino as well. I went, holy crap! Um, Oh, she yeah, she was a popular actress too. By the way, uh, tangent, complete tangent. I'm not a big WWE fan, but I'm a big, big UFC fan, and I found out that they're both owned by the same company now. Yes, they are. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, few months when that was all happening. Um, but we're not here to talk about wrestling and UFC, but uh, I do like the UFC as well. Um, UFC you know fan. what you know what if if i ever come out uh, come out there to see you and deb um we definitely got to go to a ufc event that's for sure i reckon we're gonna have a good time vegas <laughs> if anyone would like to sponsor a trip for me to go to the us um especially to vegas to take uh, debbie and um haven out please uh you know uh send an email to what if it's called business at gmail.com um i'm willing to take <laughs> a lot of cash for that um Oh God, the lines are coming out tonight, folks. Um, jeez. Now, uh, we haven't got much time left, and I do want to get to, to talk about this uh, particular project that you are in now. Um, the movie, uh, the girl that. Hang on, let me get this right. Let me write this down. No, I didn't write it down. Oh, sorry, no. The girl who left home. Can you tell me about this um upcoming movie that you're in? Yes. So this movie is near and dear to my heart. And it's be it's called The Girl Who Left Home. It's the first Filipino American movie musical that's ever released. Mm. And it's going to be available on video on demand May 30th. And it's um it'll be available on Amazon Prime and Apple um, and iTunes. So uh, but the movie itself is about a girl named Christine, who loves music and singing and performing. But she, um, she finds out her dad dies. And so she goes back home to Maryland. 
where there's a lot of unfinished business with her Filipino family who owns a restaurant. And so throughout the whole movie, you wonder, is she going to stay and help the family or is she going to go back to L.A. where she's going to pursue her career in performing? And um, I am co-starring with my uh Dear, near and dear friend, Emmy Colagato, who is also in Malcolm in the Middle, and then Paula Montalban, who was in Cinderella, um, Roger and Hammerstein's version. Cinderella, he plays my uncle. Mm -hmm. and we sing in it, and we perform in it, and then we also, there's a lot of good, good acting in it. So I'm, we shot it back in 2018. Uh, Mallory Ortega is the, she was the director, writer, producer, and she uh, is uh, extremely talented. And so she it, it this was her baby project that now is after what five years it's, it's now being distributed so the question i have to ask for that is do you re is it going to be available here in australia or only in the states because i know i know vod is they say for everywhere but uh, a lot of the time um it's only available in the states like we uh, i think it was um titanic 666 uh they said it's going to be on tubi worldwide it's still not available here in australia really yeah should be available in Australia. I'll double Beautiful. check. Beautiful. I I because I, I definitely um want to check that because after you did tell me that what you want to talk about this, I did do a little bit of research and I went, hang on, this is filmed back in 2018. Why is it taking so long? And, and like, okay, it must be good. It's I I I, I can't wait. So well, it's also because it's an independent film. So you usually mm. the circuit you have to go through film festivals, which we did back and we actually released it 2020. Uh -huh. in, in the film circuit but of course 2020 was such a hard time to release any film and so um finally it's getting its um recognition in 2023 hmm. but I, I mean independent films can take you know years to finally produce and be distributed because of the way that it's being created it doesn't have major funding up front and it's grassroots you know and that's something i learned in the process of uh, being a part of this film is how much effort and like promotion and and um work it it takes just to get it through the doors so it, it's just such an honor to be a part of this project and there's yeah. oh, you can see. well it, you're, you're right it, it, any any independent film is incredibly um a difficult process because if you guys have uh, seen uh, the episode where I interviewed uh, Anthony and Justin Best, uh, they're, they're making a film called Face On. Now they completed the filming of that, I believe this time last year. They're now still uh, producing it. Um, I have to introduce you to Anthea. She's a she's a great um, actress and um, she's Filipino as well. And I think she's tops. And oh, Justin and Justin Justin is is, is just as uh, fun. He's uh, I've become real good friends with them over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, like I'm just every every month they do release something and tell us you know how the production's going and you know we we thought last last year in um, Halloween time it was going to come out it still hasn't come out so hopefully I'm um, hopefully um, they can get it done this year because uh, I really want to see that and um, just hearing what you're just saying with with this movie okay yeah it does take a long time but also we had the pandemic which didn't really help did it. No, yeah, yeah. And, and I think finding the right distribution distribution deal is also a part of the process. So not only like pre production, the production itself, post production, and all it's all and there's a lot of moving parts to this film, like it's not just creating the, the script and the, the acting, it's the performing, there's two songs that are performed completely live on set. So that was like, very interesting that this, well, the main song that I sing is called the girl who left home. Mm -hmm. And I'm singing in the kitchen of Christine's kitchen, her family kitchen. And then the pianist is upstairs in, in the room. I'm listening to him through an earpiece. So you'll get to see like good nuggets of how that, yeah, how that kind of ended up becoming. And it's completely live, it's completely raw. And, um, but then the other ones are all pre-recorded. And then Emmy, the mom, she sings a, sing, uh, a live song at the end, again, with the pianist in the other side of the room, not being recorded with us. And here we are acting while we're singing and performing. I'm sure the levels all are, are all right but um i'm really proud of it because it's i mean it, it, it's, it's like you know think of having a little budget and then making such a big production and that's what mallory and the whole production team was able to convey and to do and i think everybody wanted it to work so um and from that we've become such so so close and so not only is the film going to be released in may 30th but the music will also be released in may 30th so you'll get wait tunes on Apple Music. All right, I'm definitely going to check that out. That's for sure. I'll probably do a reaction video to some of it because um, I love I love music um, and I love and I love supporting the Filipino culture. And if it's going to be doing both, 
I'm all for it. That's for sure. You know. Now we've come to the staple question here. What if it's cool? What is something that you find cool that nobody else does? Oh. I think I stopped another one. <laughs> what do I find cool that everybody else doesn't? That, that, that doesn't find cool. Uh, a lot of things. Yeah, just get, shoot, shoot. Just get, give us one. Give us one example. A lot of people think UFC is cool, but a lot of people. So I, I do love UFC. Um, but that's not not cool, so I can't say that. Um, <laughs> I like okay. Well, here's one. I don't know if you think this is cool or your audience thinks this is cool. All right, but go for I, it. I like campy movies with like like really campy humor, like Adam Sandler, Happy Madison, or like Medea. You know, like campy, campy humor. Like I don't know. There's something about it that makes me laugh, and it's like. I think that a lot of people are, it's acquired. Like a lot of people are like, I'm not going to watch a Medea movie or an Adam Sandler movie, like his comedy movies. And I'm like, look, I like it. I yeah. like it. All right. I'll give you that um, because, uh, oh God, I'm going to help myself on this one. Um, so one of my favorite uh, genres of film, uh, especially in, in, Philip, in the Filipino uh, film industry, is anything that's uh, got John O'Gibbs. Um, oh my God, I've forgotten, I've forgotten his name now. I think it was. My brain's gone. Eric Estrada went. No, I don't think it's him. But uh, but how campy they were! Like there was, I can't remember what the movie was called. But it was Batman something? But it was a Batman musical where it was like these two. It was like two, uh, father and son, but with the Joker and Riddler and oh no, Joker and Penguin. And then um, there was Batman one, which was like a father and son, and it is the most funniest, campiest thing <laughs> you've ever seen. Okay, another movie. Buera Biro Mahal Kita. Again, I think it's with um, wow, who's the actor? But can't be Filipino old school, like maybe eighties m- yeah. movie. My favorite movies growing up, like we would quote it. Like it's just so like campy and silly, and like the jokes are so. Hang on, like, I've, crit- got, I've got I've got one for you that that's that's on the same par as that. Over the Bakod. Oh, but I don't think I watched that one. Oh, I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send it to you. There, there, there was a two movies of that. Um, it was actually a TV series first in the '90s, and they did release um two movies of it as well. Um, it's actually on, the movies are both on um YouTube. I will still watch Over the Buckle Two religiously. I still think it's one of the campiest, funniest movies I've ever seen. And because simply because there's it just becomes ridiculous. Where um I think I think for, there was Search for Treasure, and then all of a sudden they go on an alien planet, and then they're all dressed up as like these little uh green things and then it's just yeah. it's so weird but like it it's filipino cinema like go for it exactly it's just so funny and like the the bad editing and stuff just makes it even funnier bad editing bad lip syncing it's it's all gold there that's that uh my child my childhood right there exactly same same mm. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad I finally met a Filipina that actually likes that stuff. That I, I, and because I'm 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 not a bit I'm old I'm a lot older than you, but um the the fact that they love that sort of stuff that's cool. And Haven is definitely cool on this one. <laughs> oh God, uh, I think the the nerves are gone now because I've finally found someone who's really cool um that likes that sort of stuff that I like. So thank you for that, um, Haven. Where can we find you on all your socials? You can find me on. TikTok, Haven underscore Everly, Instagram, Haven underscore Everly, YouTube, Haven Everly, and Facebook, Haven Everly. Beautiful. No uh, no Twitter? No. I mean, I have one, but I'm not active at all. Maybe those four platforms are probably where I'm the most active. All right. That's okay. I was just like, it's like, you know, Twitter, it's toxic. It just (laughs) is, unfortunately. It totally is. (laughs) Oh, Haven, thank you so much again for being part of the show. I can't wait to see what's next for you. Can't wait to eventually have you on here again. Maybe talk a bit more about our culture as well. Maybe maybe even just uh, talk about UFC as well. I think that'd be really cool if we if we get to uh, catch up and uh, see an event. That'd be cool. Yeah, I'm so game for that. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's, it's anytime. Been so- anytime. That's the end of that episode. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Want more from Whatever School? Make sure to check out the YouTube channel where you can find the latest episodes of Muffing Around, Reaction, and of course, the vlogcast. And don't forget to follow the show on all socials. It can be found at What If It's Cool. Keep that support coming. And until next time, I'll catch you on the next one. Peace. <laughs>